So that's illustrated here. We've taken a very simple problem, just so we can draw it on our slide, of a scientific simulation with 16 um, points on an edge. Um, typically in a scientific simulation, they have boundary conditions, so you'd know the value of the quantity on the edge. And you have, um, in the middle of that uh, region, you have 14 by 14 points. And um, those are the, what you want to determine. And then the value at a, a point like this is determined by its four neighbors. That's a classic nearest neighbor structure used in uh, Laplace's equation for this problem. Now, if we were doing this on a single call, we would actually take this big, big 16 by 16 mesh and stick those points in a single call and write the algorithm for that call. If we want to run it on 16 processes, or so, which is today 16 cores, we would chop this problem up into 16 parts. So each core only has 16 points, four by four little um, domain here. And it's solving the same problem in this subdomain. So this illustrates an incredibly key feature of all of these parallel processing problems. You take your original problem, you think of its algorithm. You chop the problem up into parts, and then you find the algorithm appropriate for this part. Lots and lots of problems have the feature that the algorithm for a part is closely related to the algorithm for the full set. And so that you can actually take essentially the same code that you wrote sequentially and modify it just a little to use it in parallel. This is the origin of something called single program multiple data. That the multiple data are these 16 data groups here. And the single program says we run the same algorithm on each, each of these 16 um, cores. And the, they're actually doing different things, because the data in each core is different. In fact, there's different amounts of data in each core. Uh, this core here has 16 independent points. This core up in the corner, because these boundary conditions are known, only has to find nine. But they're more or less solving the same problem. They're solving the pluses equation, in this case, in the subregion. And the, if you read some of my earlier articles, it would explain how the key difference is just in the boundary conditions. If we go back to the um, to the this one here, this Laplace's equation is defined by the equations of Laplace for each point plus the boundary conditions at the edge. If we um, go here, uh, this uh, this uh, processor up here, well, it's actually got the same boundary conditions as before here. But we have um, at this edge here, it needs to know the values of these um, of, at, at these points here. So the boundary conditions get actually replaced by a communication step, which uh, communicates information between processes. So this is a, again a key feature of all parallel algorithms. You have a, a sort of piece of arithmetic running on your CPU. And then every now and then you have to do some communication to get information from the other processes involved in the problem, which tell them information that they know, which you can then use. So this is a general structure of parallel computing, a bunch of cores working together. They do some computing and then they do some communication. Then they do some more computing, then more communication, and so on. For scientific problems, this is pretty structured. For other types of problems, it's not as structured as I said there. And, but they're still, still consisting of cores slash processes doing computing, and then exchanging information, uh, either, uh, either by writing it to disk and reading it as in Hadoop, or by sending information over over the network, as is in the case of uh, traditional um, message passing, message uh, message um, passing interface, which is used in scientific simulations. 
Here's a more complex example. Here we have an airfoil, the wing of your, your favorite aircraft. And you need to try to um, solve this problem numerically. In the previous case, I had um, a very simple case where we have uh, regular mesh points. Um, and um, here we have the same type of issue with irregular mesh points. And we have to have irregular mesh points because if you know anything about computational fluid dynamics, all the functions are changing much more rapidly near the um, wing than they are out in the far away from the wing. And therefore, to make an efficient algorithm, you chop the world up into, into in this case, so-called elements, because there's a so-called finite element method. And you'll find the elements are bigger out here where not much is going on because things change slowly and they're very close together near the wing. We will find that in order to get a sensible parallel algorithm, we'll do the same thing. We'll take these elements, we'll chop them up into groups. But we will do this in a slightly subtle fashion. In the, in the example here, the groups are all roughly the same size. The groups here, here will be rather different in geometric size, because we'll actually want to have equal number of, no, of elements in every processor. And that means that the processors will cover a big area out here and a tiny area here. And that's so called a load balancing problem, which is sort of non trivial. And lots of work has been done on how to do that in an optimal fashion. Here's another example of showing how you might calculate the uh, um, evolution of the universe. Uh, this is some um, early universe simulation done in cosmology. Uh, here's the density of stars. And again, you take your stars and chop the stars up into groups, but uh, put the stars in different processes. But now it's a little non-trivial, because by Newton's laws, the stars interact with each other. And we will need to do a rather subtle decomposition to get an equal amount of work done in um, every node. Because whereas in the previous problem, um, each element only in interacted with a few other elements in the cosmology problem. Each star interacts with lots of other stars. But the interactions are only important for nearby stars. And so calculating the total amount of work done by our processes is pretty non-trivial. And so it turns out you again have a so-called load balancing problem, trying to see how to chop these stars up into parts and put the parts in each processor. But it's not so trivial to make the work done, to get a good parallel algorithm, which is sort of naturally defined by getting the job done in the shortest possible time, which corresponds to making certain that each processor slash core has the same amount of work to be done. So these are non-trivial, you could call these engineering problems, because um, they really are not hugely difficult, but they are, do cause a lot of pain and a lot of very important research is done to get this to work well. Here's some other example from a long time ago. We have at the top a uh, little, um, uh, we have a California, and we, divide, we imagine that this California had four missile sites and they the missiles were launched from those sites, and you were in charge of tracking those missiles and shooting them down. Well, in your tracking algorithm, you to, to get good performance and track them and efficiently, you would use parallel computing. And you would probably, again, chop the problem up into parts, make certain one core was doing these four missiles here, another one, these four, and so on. So here we have a very different problem, missiles. And um, but we have still the same idea. We divide the problem up into parts and put each part in a single processor. Another example, which has uh, been implemented many times, especially a few years ago, when computer chess was very popular. It's now no longer so popular because computers are just simply too good. 
and they will beat any any uh, human chess player easily. But we have, in the case of computer chess, the way computers um, calculate and uh, play chess is they do a very brute force method. They start at the at a particular position, they look at all possible moves in that position, given one move by, say, white, pawn to king four, so the so-called e4 move. Then they look at all possible moves of black, which is either in case it might be pawn to king four, pawn to king three, pawn to queen four, and so on. And they build, they just, then they go back to white, and they build trees. And what you have to do is build those trees. You look at the end of the bottom of the tree and you score it by adding up the number of pieces left on the board and produce a score for that position. And then you try to choose the move which gives you the best score. Uh, irrespect, assuming the opposition plays the best move at each stage. And this can be done in parallel. Um, and um, here is uh, an obvious way of doing it in parallel. We take these uh, these moves here. We assign each of these moves to a different processor. We calculate the best in each processor, then take the best of the best. And this is all done in a rather subtle fashion called alpha beta pruning. And you have to refer to the literature to know how to do it completely optimally. But it's still the same idea, you decompose the problem. And here we have moves is the thing we're decomposing. So here is another example, a little related to that cosmology example, where we have a bunch of particles, I've just drawn them in two dimensions, and we're trying to chop them up into processes, and here's an example of how to do it. And this is one way of doing it. You chop the, the world up and you put processor number one with those particles, processor number two with that, and so on. An alternative is the so-called scatter decomposition. You have still four processors, you keep you, do, you make a mesh. And so uh, where one appears many times, whenever there's a one, you store that particle in processor one. And this, um, this one here I did optimally, so everybody has 21 particles. Uh, for this case here, doesn't, it's not optimal. Um, and uh, we actually have part of node one having more particles. So why would you ever use this? The advantage of this approach is when things move, because these particles will be moving around. And so it's um, not so obvious when you do this simple geometric decomposition that when they move, you'll keep the um, the load balance, and in fact, you won't. And the advantage of the scattered decomposition as things move around, it will always still be roughly right. It was never perfect at any one stage, but that's a method which is more stable than this is the optimal method at a particular time. This is a stable decomposition which can, which is probably better to use.